Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, good evening, depending on when you're watching this. I'm in a new location for my thrift cast. I decided to stay in my studio, well, in my office, I should say, instead of going up to Anthony's room, um, because I found like just the little change of scenery, as nice as it was, I wasn't going up there to film, and my camera's always here. You get the lovely view of my Peloton that needs dusting. <laughs> I used to film all my videos here when I first started, so it kind of brings me back. If you're new to the thrift cast, this is a new format that I've been trying out. This is my third thrift cast episode. This series was inspired by a pen cast video that I watch in the fountain pen community put out by the good guys over at Goulet Pens. And I actually just follow their format and apply it to thrifting because I enjoy listening to their podcast so much. Uh, so the categories that I go through in my weekly thrift cast um, is feedback and q a i talk about my flip of the week and a flop of the week oh last week i forgot to do a tip of the week but that's going to be another thing this week and then at the end i'm going to give you a little life update that sounds good to you stick around and if you enjoy this video please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel if you would enjoy more thrift cast videos all right let's kick things off with some q a all right, first question is from KN Evans 22 on Instagram. Where do you thrift on Sunday? I think it's crazy how many thrift stores are not open on Sundays. Uh, Salvation Army nearby is closed on Sundays. Goodwill is closed on Sundays. Most church thrift stores are closed on Sundays as well. So I end up going to Savers on Sundays. Savers is my go-to Sunday spot. However, to my knowledge, my local Savers doesn't restock on Sundays. So it's not always like a great day for me. I tend to post a lot of videos on Sundays and Mondays. Uh, so Sundays often can be a filming or an editing day for me. But when I do go thrifting, I typically go to Savers because they are open seven days a week in my area. I find that consignment and buy sell trade stores are open on Sundays like Buffalo Exchange or there's a consignment store that I'm thinking of that's about 30 minutes away from me that's also open on Sundays. But Goodwill and Salvation Army in my area at least, neither are open on Sundays, so Savers is my spot. All right, next question is from Bethany Len, and these uh, questions that I'm asking right now are from Instagram. I polled my audience a while ago. I need to do an updated one, but I got a lot of questions, so I'm grateful that I have a lot to work with. Bethany Len asked, what's the best thing you've incorporated into your business? Ooh, that is a really, really good question. Can I say that Tina is the best thing I've incorporated into my business? <laughs> She's been a huge help, but that probably is not a valid answer. I think streamlining my inventory system or moving towards streamlining my inventory system has really helped me. And Tina has been a big part of that. For those of you who don't know, I do have an assistant who works approximately 10 to 12 hours a week for me. And she primarily deals with um, photographing and inventorying my items. And one of the things that has been so beneficial since Tina started is that my inventory is touched a lot less. It comes into the house. If it needs washing, I wash it. After things get washed, I put them on hangers. They go downstairs to be photographed. They're photographed, they're measured, they're imported into Vendu. They are folded and put into my inventory bins. Some things get put into like Ziploc bags. Bulkier things are just put in as is. There was a time in my business where I just had piles everywhere. Piles that were being washed piles that needed to be photographed, death piles, things that I had photographed and then there was a pile I just hadn't put it into my inventory yet. And that was really the biggest bottleneck in my business, that post photograph, pile, ready to go into inventory. As time goes on and those piles are all over my house, things get lost along the way. Putting it right into inventory is the is closing the loop for me. That is something that has really helped my business quite a bit because everything is now put away in large part thanks to Tina, but I'm really seeing the value in it. Legally Red asked, how are you doing? Like really doing? Love watching your videos and hope you and your family are okay. That is the sweetest question. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm doing well um, considering everything. Again, I said this last week, I'm not going to harp on it too much but like sometimes i still can't believe my dad's gone it's been six weeks 
but I feel very blessed that my life is very full. I have an amazing support system in my husband, and my mom, my brother, my friends are so incredible. I've always contributed some of my success to having the ability to push through things. Whether the kids are struggling or I'm struggling or, you know, this was probably the biggest thing um, as far as loss in my life that I've ever encountered thus far is losing my dad. But I do believe that my husband and I both have a very strong philosophy of always moving forward. I gave myself the time that I needed and I will continue to give myself time that I need to grieve and to take the moments when I need them. But generally, I feel better when I'm productive and I feel better when I'm moving forward. I have great friends and a great job and I love checking in with all of you and I feel very fulfilled in my life and so that has helped me. Yeah, so thank you, that, that is very sweet. Okay, Birch and Bourbon asked, oh my gosh, I'm starting to worry that I've answered some of these questions before. Um, advice to someone just starting YouTube. Have I answered this yet? I hope not. If I have answered it, I wonder if my answer has changed. My advice to anybody starting on YouTube is rip off the band-aid and just press record. There are a million reasons why you can talk yourself into not starting a YouTube channel, but if it keeps you up at night, then just press record. I say all the time, I share this freely and often. The first time that I filmed a YouTube video, I filmed it the wrong way. I filmed the whole video vertically on my phone. I was in my pajamas. I said, um, a thousand times. I had no idea how to edit. I just pressed record because it was something that was eating at me. It was something that I really wanted to do. Just press record and then keep pressing record. A lot of people get their first video done and they're like, oh my gosh, I have a YouTube channel. I did it. And then they realize how much work it is or they realize that you really have to be consistent to, you know, make progress and they realize that it's hard. So I would say keep pressing record and be consistent. Set a goal. One video a week I think is a very manageable goal and just keep doing it, keep showing up, keep showing up, and you'll learn so much with every mistake you make, with every video you post, with every comment that you get. I still have so far to go as far as what I can learn about being in this space, but I do think consistency is really, really, really important. Third thing I would say is don't do YouTube because you think you need to do YouTube to be successful as a reseller. It definitely, at this stage of the game, helps me. In fact, I would say, eight out of my past 10 sales were because of a video that I put out that people saw something in a haul and then came to my channel to buy it, um, came to my page to buy it. But I've been doing this for almost five years. I'm now like getting the rewards and the payoffs of having a YouTube channel. But I see a lot of people who think they have to do YouTube to be a successful reseller. And I really disagree with that. If you don't love it, I think it's a really hard thing to force. And I also would recommend you not do this if you're doing it for money. Again, over time, you can start to make money on YouTube and with sponsorships and affiliate marketing and all that stuff, but that I would consider like a completely separate job from what I do as a reseller. Because I like doing YouTube a lot, it takes away from the reselling end of my business, which is why I ended up hiring someone like Tina to do some of the work that I struggle to get to because I'm busy doing YouTube videos. So it's a dance, it's a balance. I think one of the ways you can be successful on YouTube is to be original, do something different. Whether you're someone who loves to be analytical, uh, my friend Amber Resells is a great example of somebody who has such an analytical brain. The stuff she puts out is impactful because there's research that goes into it and she really brings value to the table. So how are you gonna bring value? How are you gonna be different? Maybe you're someone who just loves to joke around and you're more entertainment for people. But try to be different, try not to compare yourself to somebody and do it because you love it and be consistent and don't worry about fancy equipment. Right now, actually, I'm super excited because I'm working with natural lighting, which I rarely get to do. Just being five feet over to my right in this office, it's much darker over there. I'm next to a big, a few big windows here and this is great. Natural lighting is great. iPhones are great. You don't need anything technical. I use iMovie, which comes with my Mac. Those are my tidbits on YouTube. I hope I'm not missing anything. Oh, and you definitely have to have thick skin because you will get mean comments despite how nice you are 
or how neutral you try to be. You just have to be yourself. Don't try to be like anybody else. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about um, comments and stuff like that later in the video. Okay, Thrifting Casey Style asked, you always get awesome brands, but what is your all-time favorite brand to source? Gosh, I should have prepared for this question because I don't know. I know one of the ultimate things I'm on the hunt for is a Jenny Kane Fisherman's sweater in a size large black. If I could stumble upon that, I would be very excited. Whenever I get those questions, I think immediately of the big fashion houses and I think, sure, like my ultimate find would be a medium black caviar uh, Chanel bag, classic flap, you know, in pristine condition that I would either keep or resell for $5,000, that would be great. But I feel like those are just so unattainable like that I would stumble upon it. Same goes for like YSL or Louis Vuitton or, you know, some of those huge fashion houses that I could just, you know, walk into a thrift store and by miracle have this pristine condition handbag that is going to, you know, pay my mortgage for the month. Brands like Patagonia, Lululemon, I feel like they have cooled off a bit for me and I, I feel like I'm in this transition period where I'm trying to find what the next big brand is. I feel like it's actually time for me to kind of do some deep dives into what is selling on Poshmark, what are some of the top brands and items and categories that are doing well on different platforms. You know, I've been doing this for a while now and sometimes I get a little lazy and fall back on the brands that have done well for me historically and still perform decent, but like what is really big today and now? And I, I think it's probably time for me to go back to the drawing board and do some research. You know, things are always changing in fashion. I think the post-pandemic world has really shaken things up for fashion as well. And I do think it's time to like reassess things. And that actually is going to help me when I start going through my inventory and at some point start a pretty massive liquidation, which is what I would really like to do. And then kind of start fresh with fall fashion. Whether or not I'll actually do it, I'm not sure. Um, I'm trying to run sales like basically on a weekly basis on some level. Whether I'm sending offers out through Posh or VA or I am announcing something on Instagram, I don't know, but like I'm just trying to move through things quickly. I'm gonna switch over to a little bit of feedback right now. I got this comment on my YouTube channel and I thought it was really interesting. Um, and it's from Marina Hutzar. Thank you, Marina, for your comment. I feel like Marina has been with me for a while as a viewer. So I was talking about in one of my previous videos how I feel like uh, things have slowed down on Poshmark. A lot of people question if live sales are contributing to that. I've talked about how I'm embracing getting some lower end items and just flipping them fast because people maybe not spending as much like that 40 to $60 range. I've been struggling a little bit with that range and been doing a lot of like the 20 to $40 flips recently. And Marina wrote, Sometimes I feel like I'm in a league of my own. My sales are never affected, in my opinion, because I only sell upper mid-tier luxury items. And believe me, I don't pay up for them here in Hawaii. I just sent in a Chanel jacket I thrifted for $30 to The Real Real because they gave me a pre-approval pre quote of $1,545 to $2,200. Hopefully they don't lose my box again. Oh my goodness. I found this so interesting. And then somebody else wrote, this is exactly my thinking business model goal. Appeal to the people who are never touched by economic downturns. The trick is in reaching those people. With Posh and eBay being so inconsistent, unfortunately that leads to inconsistent sales for me. How long did you work to get to this point? So now Marina and she are having a conversation and Marina wrote, okay, someone who feels me, I always feel bad that I can't relate with the people ranting about slowdowns. It has always been my business model. I'm just lucky I live in Waikiki Luxury Row where it's been possible to source this way. I've been doing this for three and a half years. I saw success within six months of starting, but I'm retired military and have the time to study brands in devouring bolo videos. That's what I was just saying, that I need to revisit bolo brands. Bolo is be on the lookouts if you're new. Um, a bolo brand is just something you are on the lookout for because it should resell for a decent amount. I specifically focus on obscure luxury brands that the thrift misses. They like to mark up Michael Kors, 
but an APC cardigan I just picked up today was marked lower than the rest. I find that to be very true. And FYI, I do have items under $40, but no one is biting on those. The expensive stuff people are buying outright. Just yesterday, Ash Gladiator sandals for $163. Someone else wrote, same here, I have similar business model and this April I've already exceeded my highest sales month ever. I really wanted to talk about these comments because there's really something to be said for this and this has never really been my model, so to speak. And I just like to showcase different models because I am by far not the, the model anybody should be following. It's just what I do. I do what I do. Um, but sometimes I do think, you know, maybe I should focus more on luxury. And I think that the people who have gotten away from the bread and butter stuff, and a lot of people shop online. The first thing that a lot of people will say was like, well, I don't live in those kind of areas, so I can't buy those items. There's a woman I follow called The Global Collective on Instagram, and this is her entire business model, is buying and selling online luxury. So there's definitely something to be said for it, but I do think it takes a lot of legwork and research, and you have to always be checking out what those bolos are. I also think that Marina touched on something that I spoke about in my last video, which is the understated high-end luxury. Like I mentioned Louis Vuitton and Chanel and YSL, but those are household names. There are a lot of luxury brands that a lot of people don't know about. And I was talking about quiet luxury um, in my last video and how the show Succession, I've been watching, I've been watching Succession and then I saw articles about how they are setting the standard for um, quiet luxury that you, you're never going to see them wearing a label, but their pants that look like a basic trouser probably cost $3,000 and you would never know. And I think Marina might tap into those types of brands. So I don't have a lot to say about this because it's not my business model. But what I do want to say is it might be a great option for people who don't have a lot of space. So you're buying far fewer items and you're taking more time to do your sourcing. You're not taking home 30 piece hauls or 20 piece hauls. You may be purchasing one off items, but then you have a smaller closet. Everything's more manageable. You're not losing inventory. You're not taking up a lot of space and you're selling to people with much deeper pockets and you don't have to do the lowball offers or sell things for 15 15 and 20 dollars because your items are selling for 160 plus so i am just fascinated and intrigued by this business model and i just wanted to shed some light on these comments and i also feel badly when marina wrote i feel like i don't want to talk because i have such a different business model like people i can't relate to people struggling there are so many different business models out there and if that sounds like something you might be interested in then maybe take some of the tips that marina just shared and go forward with it i'm, I'm fascinated by it i wonder if i even took a month or two months or maybe like a quarter of the year and just focused on that, how it would change my perspective and how it might change my business model. I, I love that. Thank you for that comment to both of the women who contributed to that conversation. I also love this about my comments on YouTube. I learned so much from people. Um, okay, one other question. I, I always do this. I always go back and forth between questions and comments. Hala on YouTube asked, uh, great show. I have a question. Do you send an offer each time to likes? Thank you, I learned a lot from your shows and I love your dog. Oh, thank you. Um, I do not have automatic offer sent off, sent out on Posture VA, which is very unpopular. I don't, I don't know why. I feel like sometimes I like to control the, the sending of offers because certain things I would gladly send 30% off offers immediately and other things I would do like a 10% offer on. Maybe I should just set it to send a 10% offer out immediately. Posture VA is, an, is a bot or an automated system that sends out offers automatically for you. I use it in all of my major sales. Like if I wanna send out 50% offers out, I will use it for that, but I don't have it set to send out offers immediately. Two things I'm changing as a result of comments and things. I think I will change that to 10% 
with $5.95 shipping automatic on Poshmark and just see what happens. And the other thing is, I am going to start accepting returns on Poshmark as long as the buyer pays for shipping back. I know my friend Heidi is clapping in the background. Um, this has been something I have been meaning to do. I've been doing a lot more business on eBay and up until this point, I've never accepted returns. I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try it for the remainder of 2023 and see if my returns increase or if my sales increase or one or the other does or doesn't. We'll see what happens. But I am finally at the point where I feel like I'm okay with taking returns because the truth of the matter is when people want to return things on eBay, they find a way to return it and I end up paying for the shipping back to me. So I think what I want to do is just accept buyer pays return shipping and we'll go from there. So I'm very proud of myself for making progress and opening my mind a little bit on eBay. Let's talk about my flip of the week. All right, this is crazy, but I've had a lot of decent sales. Oh no, I see one, I see one that's good. I didn't think I had a sale that was over $65. My flip of the week, and it was also something that's been around for a year and almost a half, was on this vintage 1990s moto leather jacket. Isn't it so cool? Um, I got this in, uh, it wasn't necessarily in a state buyout. It was someone who I know from my hometown who asked me to come to her house and buy a bunch of stuff. And I spent a thousand dollars. I'll link that video above. It was a thousand dollar buyout. I paid her cash. Um, I do have a video of when I went to the house and what I saw in that buyout. At the very, very end, I ended up getting two Louis Vuitton speedy bags and they needed a lot of work, a lot of work. But I sold one for $300 and one for $500. So those sales paid for the bulk of the items. I think I got approximately 50 items. Anyways, this leather jacket was in that haul and it was beautiful, soft, soft leather from the 90s, new with tag. And I believe I had it priced at $199 and it had been around. I did that during my happy holidays that I do every year during the Christmas season. That was happy holidays of 2021. It's been a while and this sold for $90. My average cost of goods for that haul was $20. So 90 less 20%, that's 18 minus my $20. So that's $38 from 90, so where am I at? 52, 52 and 38, that's 90, yeah. So a $52 profit. It was less than I wanted, but I'm at this point, again, trying to get rid of stuff. So I was really happy about that. That was a good flip. Okay, now let's do my flop of the week. So my flop of the week is that I washed, put through the wash, two items that I got at the bins that were new with tags. So one of the things I was talking about earlier, do I wash items or whatever? I don't wash items that are new with tags unless I'm not paying attention. One was a $49.99, it was so $50, like a cocoon style sweatshirt from Eddie Bauer, beautiful, soft, new with tag, boom, put that through the wash. And then I also put a Lane Bryant shirt that was new with tag. And I don't know, I think the price tag was like $34.99. So almost $90 worth of new with tag items in the wash, no longer new with tags. And I need to slow down because those are the things I do when I'm in a hurry. Have you ever washed an item that was new with tag and just washed the tag right off? Because that's what I did. That was my flop of the week. I have a return coming back and it's always such a bummer when return comes back from Poshmark because you can't take partial returns. And it was on a bundle that was $156. There was, there was nothing I could do about this. It was a pair of Free People velvet ankle boots. They were at a warehouse sale, so I think they were returned and you know maybe imperfect that's usually what end, ends up at warehouse type of sales but it was technically new but not new because it was a return so I didn't I didn't mark them as new but my buyer couldn't unzip them like she got them on and I maybe wore them but then when she went to take them off she couldn't unzip them like they were stuck they weren't going anywhere which was a bummer I mean I guess you maybe that's a, a tip to 
check your zippers and such but that was something that i didn't do and now that entire bundle's coming back to me so it may be that she wants to keep some of the items and maybe i can reach out to her and we can renegotiate but it's it's just messy i wish poshmark allowed partial returns it would it would make life so much easier um because yeah that was a nice bundle 156 dollars that's coming back so that's a bummer my tip of the week it touches a little bit on the YouTube thing and just social media in general. But my tip of the week is to get a P.O. box if you have any sort of public presence on social media. It's good for your business. It's nice to have something separate that you can send business stuff to. But I've recently had a little bit of a, a scare with a viewer and it was the first time or one of the times that I have really felt so, so grateful that I have a P.O. box for privacy sake. A P.O. box is, you know, just someplace that you can, you go pick your mail up at the post office so you're not putting your home address out publicly. I think that a P.O. box is a really good tip for your business if you are sharing information on a social media platform. It will cost a little bit of money and it depends on the size of your P.O. box and it depends on your town. My P.O. box I think recently went up in price but it's it's a little over $100 a year for my P.O. box and worth every single penny. Now let's talk about some time with Tata. Let's catch up on my life. So just rolling off of what happened. I had an incident that I had to go to my local police with. It was a viewer who was at one point a fan, I guess I could say, has been watching me for a while, um, but approached me with a question. She had reported me to Instagram and she was calling her local authorities because she felt like I was bullying her by deleting comments on Instagram and YouTube. And then things got bad really fast. It ended with me having to block this person and then she started a new account and was harassing me from a separate account. This morning, I had a message from that same second account, which I blocked. There's a way that you can view the message even if you've blocked that person. Anyways, the message just said, you will regret this, dot, dot, dot. I've just never had anything like this happen before. It really makes me question how much I share here because I tend to be an open book and it's part of my personality. I'm kind of an oversharer. I talk about my kids and you see my dog and I talk about vacations and sometimes I take a step back and I'm like, whoa, why are you sharing that much? I do think that you can never be too careful and I've never dealt with anything like this before. And I've been on YouTube for five years and 99.9% .9 of the people are wonderful. I would just encourage everybody to be careful. Never share any information that could potentially put you in harm's way. And, and I, I feel like I probably have. I think getting a PO box is one of the ways you can safeguard yourself a little bit. So anyways, outside of that, things have been good. Now I don't want to share too much. Um, I did release a video about my experience with Noom. That's on my second channel. If anybody wants to check that out, that's like a weight loss app that I've been really enjoying. So I give my, my full thoughts. You know, my reviews are never very technical, but I just kind of talk about my experience. And I just released that last night. I'm really trying to do a little bit more on my second channel just because I feel like it, I'm kind of liberated over there. I can talk about whatever I want to talk about. My mom came over last week. It would have been my mom and dad's 54th anniversary. And so I wanted to make sure we did something special on that day just to lift her spirits. And she came over and she made the best. I found the recipe online. My mom and I both love sweet greens, but the closest one is like 40 minutes away from me. So we were gonna go out to dinner, but my mom likes to just eat at home and she's a great cook. And I was out thrifting or I had something going on that day. And I said, if you wanna pick up the ingredients to make the harvest bowl, from sweet green, we can do that. And then we can watch 80 for Brady. So that's what we did. And I found a recipe online. I'll share the link in my description. It is literally to a T right down. The dressing is what made it. The dressing is so similar to the dressing. It's like a balsamic dressing um, at sweet green. It was so delicious. And we made a vat of it. It's got kale, sweet potatoes, um, almonds, goat cheese, apples and grilled chicken 
and it's like this like uh, balsamic-y dressing that goes with it. Oh my gosh, the best, best salad. And then we watched 80 for Brady, which is the movie with um, Sally Field, Jane Fonda, um, Lily Tomlin. It's about women who go to the 2017 Super Bowl because they're huge Tom Brady Patriots fans and it was just so much fun. So that was a really fun night I had with my mom. We went to a great rummage sale last weekend so she's a great thrifting buddy. The kids are coming home from college and so I'm gearing up to having a full house again. They are so excited to spend some time with Lumpy and I think it's going to be so much fun to have them home. It's also an adjustment. The groceries are different the messes are different. I was not sure how I was going to do with Empty Nest and that was one of my questions from last week and I reported that I've been doing really okay with Empty Nest and now they're all coming back. Not all of them. Angie and Rocco will be home and we're going to have a full house again and it's going to be our new summer schedule so I'm going to have to work on juggling the kids when Tina's here and like their work schedules and food and the puppy who is very regimented with his boring life with mom and dad and then the kids are gonna come home and they're gonna wanna play, play, play. I'm really looking forward to having them home, but it is gonna be an adjustment, but I am overall very excited. And we need to plan a family vacation. We don't know what we're doing. Our trip to pay Spain got canceled because um, we were supposed to go the week that we lost my dad. So we kind of have this vacation that we wanted to take and didn't. But then it's a challenge to be on a schedule where everybody is available. So we'll see about that. All right, I pressed pause really quickly because my buddy was up from his nap. He took a nap in his pen instead of being in his crate. And he did such a good job, huh, Lumpy? He's getting so big. He, look at him. He's such a cutie. He's going for his, um, he has to get his vaccine shots on May 1st. But I'm mostly curious how much he weighs because he's getting so big. I can't believe we've had him for almost six weeks. It's, it's just crazy to me. Just like babies, they grow up so fast and I feel like he's starting to like test his boundaries a little bit. He still sleeps like an absolute champ in his crate. During all of this filming, I had him in his pen. So not his crate, but he ended up taking his nap in his pen and like he can play in there. But we're basically, if he's not, if he's not going potty when he's supposed to go potty, he's going right back into his pen. And I'm happy to report that he's getting much better about giving kisses and not just biting because I, I kiss him about 3000 times a day, but he's such a love, right Lumpy? And I still want to do a video on him on my second channel. I haven't done it yet, but whenever I do it, it's going to be, you know, my first blank weeks with my cockapoo. <laughs> <laughs> depending on you know when I actually get that film but I think this would be kind of a fun time he has been going to puppy classes and I don't know if you follow me on Instagram but last week they do puppy playtime right at the very end for like three minutes they matched him up with a pug named Rocco which I think is so hysterical and Rocco like just annihilated him like Lumpy was just submissive on his back like for most of the time he did okay like hanging in there because he does like to play um, but because he doesn't have a brother or sister at home, I think it's important for him to socialize there. It's supervised puppy play and it, it lasts all of like three minutes. I don't want people to be mad if Lumpy's not in a video. So say goodbye. Say goodbye to everybody. We gotta go outside. Okay. But oh my God, he is like a real life teddy bear. I love him. I love him so much. Okay. Now he's eating my earring. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this week's thrift cast. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you wanna see more from me and you wanna be part of my YouTube family here. Thank you all so much for being such a supportive community. For every one bad experience I have, I have about 100 wonderful ones. So thank you for being awesome.